It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thanks for listening to another episode. I'm your host, Blair Hodges. At the end of 2013, a new gospel topics essay appeared on LDS.org, the official website of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The essay, called Race and the Priesthood, affirms the universal sister and brotherhood of humanity, explaining that Latter-day Saint scripture and teachings affirm that God loves all of his children and makes salvation available to all. God created the many diverse races and ethnicities and esteems them all equally. The essay traces the church's complicated history of perspectives on race, including the controversial restriction of priesthood and temple participation by black members of the church, which was lifted in 1978. LDS church history on this topic is complex, so in this special two-part episode, I talked to two historians, Paul Reeve and Artis Partial. Together they edited a book called Mormonism, a historical encyclopedia, but more recently, Paul Reeve published a landmark book with Oxford University Press called Religion of a Different Color, Race and the Mormon Struggle for Whiteness. In part one, this episode, Reeve, who is a U of U professor of history, talks about the concept of race in the 19th century. His book relates the puzzling story about how Mormons had to struggle to be recognized as white. The struggle had dramatic consequences, especially for black members of the church. After we set the stage in part one, part two will focus on the priesthood and temple restriction in particular. We'll also cover interesting aspects of working as a historian and independent historian artist Partial will talk about the benefits of seeking out lesser known Latter-day Saint stories. And both historians will reflect on how they theologically think through the difficult issues posed by church history. It's Paul Reeve talking about religion of a different color in this episode, and Paul and Artis both join me in the next episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Welcome to the show, Paul Reeve and Artis Partial. Thank you, Blair. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Glad to be here. Well, I wanted to start by talking about the I'm a Mormon publicity campaign, which the LDS Church launched in 2010. This campaign featured a variety of people from around the globe, uh, a racially diverse group of Americans as well, mixed race couples, and it was designed to let the wider public know that Mormons aren't secluded or outdated to kind of show Mormon diversity. So showing so many different people is considered a positive today. It's incorporated into a, a publicity campaign. Your book, Religion of a Different Color, is framed around a, a different piece of, uh, of media from 100 years earlier. This is a political cartoon from Life magazine back in 1902. The cartoon also depicts Mormons as being racially diverse, but for an entirely different reason. Um, talk a bit about that cartoon. So the Life magazine cartoon uh, is simply titled Mormon Elderberry out with his six-year-olds who take after their mothers, and it's a internationally and racially diverse group of children that he's holding hands with. And uh, it's it's really striking, you know, as you point out, if this were to appear in, you know, 2014, we might imagine the church's public affairs department recruiting several of Elderberry's children to be in its I'm a Mormon campaign. But in 1904, Life magazine was not intending this as a celebration of Mormon diversity. Uh, in fact, I see it as Life magazine's effort at trapping Mormonism in a racially suspect past at the same time that Mormonism is attempting to transition into a white and pure future. So I, I start with this political cartoon as this moment of racial transition for Mormonism. Obviously, it's an attack on polygamy, but more than an attack on polygamy, um, I think the book really demonstrates that outsiders aren't just afraid that polygamy is destroying the traditional family. They're afraid that it's destroying the white race. And Mormon Elderberry's, uh, this political cartoon and his interracial family and this international family really highlight that and capture it in, in just one simple picture. So this is an idea that I think will be new to a lot of people. Um, and this is the idea that Mormons had to struggle for whiteness. There's a part of the introduction where you write, the Mormon struggle for whiteness is a microcosm of the history of race in America. And I, and I think people will be surprised to hear that Mormons had to struggle to be recognized as white. And we'll drill more down into Mormonism uh, a little bit later on. But first, let's talk about the second part of that sentence, the idea that America has a history of race. I'd like you to talk a little bit about American views of race in the 19th century as Mormonism was getting started. 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, I've been working on the book for for seven years now, and um, especially when I tell people the subtitle for the book, Race and the Mormon Struggle for Whiteness, I get a lot of really kind of um, strange looks, and uh, especially sort of skeptical looks on people's faces. And, you know, I understand that, and I think people should be skeptical, especially if we um, are understanding race from a 21st century perspective, what you really have to do is go back and recover what race meant in the 19th century. Uh, But I invite the skepticism. I hope people are skeptical and skeptical enough to buy the book and look at the evidence for themselves. Really what I'm suggesting then is that you need to recover a very fluid and illogical racial context in the 19th century wherein this monolithic whiteness is fracturing. In America. And Mormonism is born into this period wherein monolithic whiteness is fracturing. And um, race was understood both as a nationality, as well as uh, skin color, as well as character traits, and a variety of different things are associated with race. So that a variety of people are raced in the 19th century. Why did that matter, though? Like, you talk a little bit about hierarchical views of race, like they could categorize for what reason? Yeah, so this is the way that Americans are trying to um, sort out the various peoples who are uh, coming to America, so Irish immigrants. Um, Because they look white to us, right? You look at photographs in the 19th century, Irish people, they're white, aren't they? Absolutely. So um, if we're just basing it on um, our our, uh, perception of skin color, right, everyone's going to simply say that Irish people are white. But, you know, uh, there are a variety of whiteness studies that have been done, and it was partly in engaging these whiteness studies that I kept saying, wow, you know, this is happening to Mormons. The interesting thing is that they're an inside religious group, and yet they're being racialized in the same way that Irish people are being racialized. So cartoons of Irish people in the 19th century will frequently include uh, simian or ape-like features associated with being Irish, comparisons to black people in the 19th century, so they're more black than white, and it's sort of this argument of guilt by association. You're more like them, the undesirable group, the marginalized group, than you are like us, and therefore we can justify discriminatory policies against you. So uh, America in the 19th century is really about creating a hierarchy of races, right? Which race is at the top? And so Anglo-Saxons are perceived to be the superior race because they have come from Europe, marched across Europe, and as they've done so, um, they've left um, adherence to despotic rule behind, they've left polygamy behind, they um, then march to America and establish um, a constitution based on freedom, and so these are really freedom-loving people, and freedom equals whiteness. And the first Congress, 1790, establishes conditions for citizenship. And you have to be a free white person to be a citizen. So obviously, uh, whiteness is deemed normative. It's the normal condition, and anything that's less than white is the other. And so what you see then is uh, outsiders trying to make sense of the Mormons. You have this inside religious group. Had they not converted, they would have been at the top of the racial ladder. Most Mormons are either um, native-born Americans or coming from Western and Northern Europe. It's just white. Yeah. Right? And so when they convert, however, there's this effort, and it's sort of this process that I trace in, in the first chapter of the book of – uh, figuring out a identity for them, and it starts that identity starts to accumulate a variety of assumed negative character traits that become applied to the whole group, not to just individuals, right? And they start to associate what it means to be a Mormon with these negative character traits, like they did with black people, like they did with Native American people, like they did with Irish. Um, you know, like they did with uh, Asian immigrants in a variety of ways, you you start to assume that all, you know, black people are lazy, um, have hypersexuality, all of these sort of assumed racial characteristics, and they start to do this with Mormons as well. So the assumption is that then Mormons become a, a group that is racialized, Um, as less than white. This effort to move them away from the top of the um, hierarchical ladder uh, to make them less than acceptable and to basically justify discriminatory policies against them. 
One of the really striking things in the book is when you actually provide your examples, because this this idea of race and this level of discrimination seems so foreign to most people today. So when you talk about it theoretically like this, it's it's it just seems strange. When you read the actual words of some of the people, it's shocking. And I'm thinking of, for example, of uh, John C. Calhoun, who was a a senator in the late 1840s, he puts a resolution forward regarding Mexico. As the United States has uh, won the, the the war, and they're deciding: Are we going to incorporate Mexico? What are we going to do? And you've got these quotes from him in here that are astounding. Uh, for example, Calhoun says, "We've never dreamt of incorporating into our union any but the Caucasian race, the free white race." Ours, sir, is the government of a white race. He feared that uh, bringing in new races would place them on an equality with the people of the United States. He says, there's no instance whatever of any civilized colored races being found equal to the establishment of free popular government. We make a great mistake when we suppose that all people are capable of self-government. These are are shocking comments to read. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, that very idea that, that Calhoun articulates is really crucial to keep in mind as, as um, you know, a person reads the book, simply because that's really what is at stake in the outsider's mind with Mormonism. So it's all based upon this development theory, the whole notion that all societies go through three basic stages. Uh, they begin at savagery, progress to barbarism, and then from barbarism to civilization. The notion was that as societies, all societies go through these developmental stages, that as they do so, they leave things like um, adherence to despotic rule and— Tyrannical. Yeah, tyrannical government. leadership, um, you know, uh, that you're going to just simply um, blindly obey, you know, whoever your leader is. That notion is sort of embedded in this progress from savagery to barbarism to civilization, um, as well as the other argument was that um, polygamy is also left behind, that uh, savage societies and barbaric societies practice polygamy, but not civilized people. So the fear then is that you see um, people who... Uh, on first blush appear to be white. These are people who are from Western and Northern Europe as well as from America who should be freedom-loving white people, Anglo-Saxons at the top of the racial ladder, but now they're converting to Mormonism, so they're giving their free will over to what is branded from the outside of despotic rule, uh, giving their will over to Joseph Smith or to Brigham Young, and especially after uh, polygamy is openly announced, they're practicing polygamy. White people should not do this. Marriage is racialized in the 19th century. Monogamy is explicitly stated as the preserve of the white race. And so here the fear is that Mormons uh, represent a fearful racial decline. And basically the book uh, really sort of just is is a, a lot of examples of how people are fearful that Racial decline is bound up in Mormonism. And it's not just that you have this suspect religious group, but then democracy is at stake. Because if uh, democracy is the government of a white race and you have white people who are participating in uh, you know, a religious system that equals uh, giving away their, their will to a despotic ruler as well as in polygamy, then democracy is is at stake in the minds of people like John C. Calhoun and other political uh, thinkers in the 19th century. Really, that's what they believe is going on in the American West, is that there is a a deterioration from whiteness, which equals, uh, you know, this inability to practice and participate in democracy. One of the things about the book that stands out uh, and that I, I wanted to ask you about was the fact that you identify these sort of political reasons for the discussions about race and the perceptions of race. There are scientific justifications that are based in scientific thinking of the time. There are religious justifications that are based on readings of the scripture. And I just wondered how how difficult it was to take those separate threads and weave them into one historical narrative, because when you do that, it kind of smooths things over, or you, you make it into a coherent narrative. How was it taking all those different elements, scientific, political, religious, and putting them together in one book talking about the issue of race? Yeah, it's um, it's not easy, um, that's for sure. And, you know, um, 
on the one hand, that's sort of the job of the historian, right? You take all of these various sources and you have to make sense of them because the average person doesn't have the luxury, and I guess I consider it a luxury because I'm a historian, but um, or the will or the desire to actually scour the ar- archives and sort of um, get all of these sources and, and, and collect them um, and then bring them together into, um, you know, a readable narrative. Uh, but in doing so, um, you know, it, it sometimes does sort of smooth out or, or make seem um, to the reader, you know, um, perhaps that it's um, a more organized kind of um, take on Mormonism than what the record actually can substantiate. So the, the job of the historian is also to sort of organize these sources and sort of make sense of them for the reader. But in doing so, it um, perhaps smooths out the messiness um, more than, you know, if you were just dealing with the raw data. But once again, that's that's sort of the job of, of the historian. And I kind of um, try to at least uh, attune the reader to that notion in the introduction that, my goodness, this was just a mess. And people yeah. from the time period couldn't ever quite figure out um, how they thought about Mormons. But they're just sort of throwing a variety of things yeah. out there, right? Maybe they're more red than they are white. Maybe they're more savage than they are white. Maybe they're more black than they are white. Maybe they're more Asian or Oriental. Um, maybe they're just less white. Uh, so in a variety of ways, they're sort of groping, but they are associating Mormons with a variety of marginalized groups and in the process marginalizing Mormons. So, um, you know, I try to bring coherence to it, but certainly the historical record isn't as well organized, perhaps, as, you know, um, it's presented in the book. Uh, and I organize it around Mormon Ellerberry's children. So the children, um, you know, uh, become the organizational tool. And, you know, the black girl in Mormon Ellerberry's family gets four chapters. The Native American gets two. The uh, Oriental child gets one. And then the six white children only get one chapter. Uh, but in any case, I'm sort of trying to organize the way in which outsiders saw Mormons as less than white. That's Paul Reeve. He's Associate Professor of History at the University of Utah and author of the new book, Religion of a Different Color, Race, and the Mormon Struggle for Whiteness from Oxford University Press. He also co-edited Mormonism, a historical encyclopedia, which was co-edited with Artist Partial, and we'll speak with her a little bit later in the show. Paul, you write that, uh, that the Mormon experience highlights the racialization process at work from the very birth of a suspect group. So the Mormon experience gives historians an opportunity to see the imputation of race to a select group of people from the very beginning. For years, religious scholars have said Mormonism is a great way to look at the beginnings of a new religion. You're suggesting Mormonism is also a good way that historians can look at the origin of race. Yeah, that's right. And and I know that people will be surprised by that idea. But once again, I kind of welcome their skepticism. Um, so uh, I, I think really what you see with Mormonism is sort of, um, you know, uh, especially in this highly racialized culture in the 19th century, this effort to figure out who they are. And because they're born into this really charged racial environment, um, one way in which outsiders try to figure out who they are, who they are, is through a racial lens, not just a religious lens. And I'm not dismissing the religious mm-hmm. part of it. It's it's important and it's crucial. And other historians have done a fantastic job of of looking at that. I'm saying here's another facet. I'm not trying to replace that, but I'm saying here's another facet of the story that we haven't looked at. And so what you see then is, um, you know, uh, I think that the ability to kind of trace this trajectory over time and um, initially there, it starts with a label, Bla- uh, excuse me, Mormonite, and then Mormon, and then by the 1840s. Why did they need to be labeled to begin with? I mean, what about Mormonism? There was a lot of different religious groups that were being labeled, so they got the Mormonite label. What made Mormons different from, like, Quakers? Why weren't Quakers racialized compared to Mormons being racialized? Yeah, well, um, you know, it starts out just simply with um, a term that they're using from from the Book of Mormon, but it's it's a way to try to, I think, justify discriminatory policies. How do you justify an extermination order against people who look like you? And in a country that values the white race, so to speak. Exactly, exactly. When when whiteness is is seen as essential, right, and you have white people who are 
uh, then, you know, joining this religion, I think it's just an effort at justifying discriminatory policies. So you start to associate negative characteristics with the term Mormonite and then Mormon. And then eventually, um, you know, by the 1840s, they're, they're saying Mormon race. And, uh, you know, by 1860, um, an associated group of physical characteristics with what that race was. So they were making it a little more scientific even. They were going further than... I mean, you had government reports, for example, right? There was a, a, a doctor who was out with the Army expedition and, and observed Mormons. Yeah, that's right. So um, Dr. Roberts Balthalo came west with, with Johnston's Army and observed Mormons for a couple of years. And when he leaves Utah, he files a report with the United States Senate. And he gives a full-blown physical description of a degraded Mormon body. Uh, and this is not just sort of a um, something that gets filed in the United States Senate and forgotten as a government report, but in fact, by the end of 1860, there's a conference on the Mormon body held at the New Orleans Academy of Sciences, and several doctors attend this conference, and uh, one objects, only one doctor objects, and he says, look, it's only 30 years since this, um, right. this religion began. It's too early to suggest that it's giving rise to a new race. We should observe it for at least another 30 years before we can <laughs> arrive at that firm <laughs> conclusion. All the other doctors at the conference actually buy Barthelo's argument and even uh, push it further. And it doesn't just go away. There are other doctors who come to Utah Territory who file similar reports, and Bartholo doesn't back away from it, but, uh, you know, as a part of the medical community, he gives another speech on it in, in Ohio and pushes it even further without any sort of additional evidence, no record of him returning or sort of doing any kind of scientifically verifiable kind of study, but he just simply um, expands upon his earlier notions of a degraded Mormon body and calls them a Congress of lunatics. See, and that's what suggests to me that it was maybe a little bit more political for him because you did have that objection to him where, you know, one scientist is saying, look, we need empirical data. We need to, we need an actual study. You've given us anecdotes. And rather than doing that, Bartholo mm -hmm. just goes kind of on a little speaking tour and doesn't go on to do those things that even the science, even the colleagues he had that appreciated his first report said, yeah, that's right. Why don't we go on and do more work on this? He didn't. No, that's right. It, it, it really is kind of perplexing to me um, uh, that, you know, there really isn't, uh, at least he doesn't give us evidence that, that he has done anything to try to, you know, use a scientific methodology. The one doctor who objects um, argues that there's got to be some sort of methodology um, that would satisfy sort of the broader scientific community and no evidence that he ever does that. And yet he sort of doubles down on his claims. Uh, I think he's really trying to situate the Mormon body within kind of his understanding of human sexuality in the 19th century. And the prevailing notion is that people who engage in sexual intercourse can imprint their kind of carnal desires and, and lustful desires upon the unborn fetus. Uh, and this is um, producing then a degraded race because polygamy is inherently lustful in his mind. And it's all about satisfying simply physical desires. And therefore, because it's all about engaging in, um, you know, carnal desires, uh, then Mormons are leaving their carnal desires imprinted on the unborn fetus. And that is creating a degraded race. And so it sort of gets bound up, I think, in, in kind of his understanding and 19th century understanding of sexuality. But in any case, he doesn't ever kind of uh, use what would be considered rig rigorous scientific methodology, and it's really um, kind of baffling, especially from the 21st century, to uh, try to understand how he came to the conclusions that he did. But nonetheless, they're there. Yeah, and I just got the feeling that there was more to it for him personally than than the science. There may have been. There may have been. And, and you know, um, personal animosity may have been sort of bound up in it. it um, it's hard to figure it out. I simply don't know. Or just having an interesting project, right? Yeah, that, that sure. Will, <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of things. That's, 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 you know, the historian always bumps up against those walls where there are things the records can't really tell us about that. But That's right, yes. Um, so you mentioned polygamy. That's one of the reasons outsiders were so alarmed about this new Mormon race is because it was reproducing itself. So that played into anti-polygamy discussions. I think one of the most important elements of your book is your the way that you show that Mormons themselves begin buying into the same sort of assumptions about race. 
comparing Mormons to black people or to Native Americans and so forth obviously trades in on negative views of those people, right? Discrimination. And when Mormons began buying into some of those same assumptions, they began turning them back against the people who were accusing them, right? So this was especially the case in the debate about polygamy. There was the idea that polygamy would degenerate the race. How did Mormons respond to that in terms of what their sexual practices were actually doing? Yeah, that's right. So some historians have have talked about some of the speeches coming from Mormon leaders in the 19th century that uh, demonstrate this idea or this argument that polygamy is in fact giving rise to an elevated celestial angelic race. And, you know, sort of find it curious, and I think rightfully so, and um, suggest that Mormonism is in fact anticipating the eugenics movement, which sort of... um, you know, comes later at the, at the turn of the, the 20th century. And I'm simply suggesting that the best way to understand those statements by Mormon leaders is to understand them as an argument against the charge that polygamy was giving rise to a degraded race. And so you have people like Albert Carrington and George Q. Cannon who are simply suggesting that, in fact, polygamy is ordained of God. Because it's ordained of God, the outcome will be God-like, and that polygamy is, in fact, producing an elevated celestial and even divine race. So neither side is really uh, questioning the notion that a marital practice could give rise to a race. They're only um, debating the outcome. And one side deformed and degraded, the other side angelic and celestial. You mentioned George Q. Cannon. There's a quote here. Mormons kind of gave a unique twist to the same ideas that were going on about procreation and about how it impacts offspring. George Q. Cannon says, uh, Do good spirits want to partake of the sins of the low and degraded? No. They will stay in heaven until a way is opened for purity and righteousness to form a channel in which they can come and take honorable bodies in this world. Um, Orson Hyde, for his part, promised that Mormon offspring will be the fairest specimens of the work of God's hand. That polygamy was a way, he says, to, quote, improve our own race. So they're buying into these same assumptions, but then sort of baptizing them with Mormon theological ideas. Well, yeah, I I, I think that's right. I I, I think the best way to understand those um, statements from Mormon leaders is in uh, context of the way in which outsiders were describing Mormonism as uh, producing a degraded race. And the Mormon pushback is, oh, yeah? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, it's giving rise to an angelic celestial race, but, you know, with unique Mormon twists. Um, there are spirits waiting in heaven, um, and they only want to be, the, the choicest spirits only want to be born into the most righteous family lines because polygamy is ordained of God. That's uh, providing sort of a righteous family line for them to be born into. So the choicest spirits will be born um, into these families, and therefore they are as the choice of spirits, sort of uh, elevated bodies, an elevated race, uh, Mormons will argue. So both sides of the debate, Mormons and outsiders who are accusing Mormons of degeneracy and and of non-whiteness, are arguing that their sexual practices will result in an elevated race. So they have the same assumptions. They're just saying, we got the right way, you got the wrong way. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, you know, uh, I mean, this is this uh, debate will also produce some of the arguments that the Mormons will make about, uh, you know, that uh, po- polygamy is the better marriage practice, that monogamy um, inherently uh, creates, uh, you know, adultery, fornication, uh, that the, the, the other part of the argument is that men uh, simply have greater sexual needs than women, and that to satisfy their sexual desires, men who are married in in monogamy have to go outside the bounds of monogamy. But polygamy provides a solution, and especially if you throw in the notion that um, uh, you shouldn't engage in sexual intercourse if a woman is pregnant or nursing, Mm -hmm. because it has the ability to kind of uh, uh, imprint those carnal desires on the unborn fetus, then uh, polygamy is the answer. Uh, if one wife is pregnant, then the man can fulfill his sexual de- desires still within the bounds of marriage. Monogamy only allows them to go outside the bounds of marriage. And George Buchanan will actually argue uh, that, in fact, this is why you know um, 
um, societies based on monogamy decline and deteriorate. So he gives Rome, ancient Rome, as an example. And the better societies are the Eastern societies that practice polygamy. He was a pretty good historian of Rome then, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, I mean, sort of laughable arguments um, to us in, in the 21st century. But he's engaged in this debate, and mm-hmm. it becomes a debate about Western and Eastern civilizations, in fact. I mean, those are the grounds of the debate. Um, And once again, you sort of have to situate it within this very uh, fluid and illogical racial context. That's Paul Reeve. He's the author of Religion of a Different Color. So, so far, we've kind of talked about race in general in in the 19th century United States in particular. We've talked a little bit about how Mormons were being racialized. We've talked a little bit about how Mormons sort of turned the tables and tried to push back against accusations that they were degenerating the race. I think um, contemporary Mormons might be surprised to hear that their their foremothers and forefathers fought for a white racial identity. And Mormons are used to talking about their history of persecution, about being driven from their homes and these types of things, but this never comes into the story. It's it's kind of overlooked. And I think that, that Mormons might be even a bit more uncomfortable with what was going on inside Mormonism, rather than Mormonism against outsiders, what was happening within Mormonism. And so following Elder Barry's children from that cartoon, you, as you mentioned, you separated the book out into uh, different perceived races, uh, Native American, Black, and what was referred to then as Oriental. And we'll, we'll use that term more uh, that that's the term they use today. We obviously don't use that term, but it's a historical term. That's right. Mormons had different views toward these different groups of of race. So let's start with uh, Native Americans. What was the Mormon approach early on to Native American peoples? Well, the Mormons obviously uh, viewed Native Americans at least partly through a theological lens, and they used the Book of Mormon to inform their understanding of who Native Americans were. And so, you know, uh, they see them as fallen descendants of ancient Israel in need of redemption. And one way in which they can be redeemed uh, is through intermarriage. And intermarriage, Brigham Young argues, and other Mormon leaders uh, argue, will create a white and delightsome race out of Native Americans. And so um, in this move towards whiteness that Mormonism makes, they are attempting to bring Native Americans with them in their efforts at achieving whiteness. And, you know, this earns them sort of the scorn of of the nation um, and all kinds of accusations that they are conspiring with Indians against true white America, that they are descending below the level of the Indians, more savage than the savages. Uh, and then they're producing a degenerate race uh, as a result of their marriages with Native Americans. From the inside, Mormons are simply arguing that it's a, a form of racial uplift, in fact. So yet again, it's just further evidence of sort of this um, debate and this struggle that's taking place over uh, the terms of whiteness. You talk about British Israelitism and how that informed early Mormon views of what they were was it important then for early Mormons to have that sort of Caucasian British Israelitism? Talk about that context and how that played into the idea of racial uplift for Native Americans. Yeah, so there's this um, British Israel movement that predates Mormonism, and it, it it's around throughout the 19th century. Um, the notion that um, Britain then becomes um, the the location for the lost tribes of Israel and that, in fact, then they are the preserves of, of ancient Israel and, and uh, gets kind of wedded with the notion of this Anglo-Saxon triumphal narrative that, you know, Anglo-Saxons are then the true preservers of liberty and freedom. They've abandoned despotic rule. They're the champions of self-determination. And in order to then um, create a government of freedom, you have to be an Anglo-Saxon. I mean, that's sort of how wedded it becomes in the minds of, of people in the 19th century. And so you have Mormons who, who plug into that same context. And when you have these vast conversions taking place in, in Britain as well as uh, you know Northern and Western Europe, uh, it sort of reinforces this notion that when Mormons are converting, 
Um, they're not just joining a new church, they're redeeming ancient Israel. So uh, Brigham Young certainly buys into this idea. They had a lot of success in England as well, right? So that Absolutely. sort of had to coincide with that expectation. Yeah, that's exactly right. They they just become convinced because the conversions convince them that this is true. It's sort of a self-reinforcing kind of idea that, um, you know, the field is white and ready to harvest, and they are really harvesting a lot of white people. And Brigham Young will simply say that, you know, Anglo-Saxons are the Ephraimites. And he sort of reinforces that notion uh, that it is... That, that, in fact, they are um, Anglo-Saxons and preservers of liberty and all of those kind of wonderful things that outsiders are suggesting they're not, and they're trying to claim that uh, identity for themselves uh, on the inside at the same time that they are being uh, denigrated from the outside. The Native American question seems to have put Mormons in kind of a difficult spot because, as you said, there were repeated accusations of Mormons collaborating with Indians and that there would be some sort of uprising, that they would enlist them against the government. Indians had just been um, tragically moved uh, to the frontier. That's where Mormons were headed as well. So they, you know, outsiders would look at this and say, oh, these two groups, Mormons are saying positive things about Native Americans trying to meet with them. They're going to they're going to come and take take it back. And Mormons, some Mormons fed into those fears by uh, saying things about Native Americans being the Lord's battle axe and this type of thing. But Mormons then would also go out of their way to say, hey, we're not, we're not collaborating with them. So Mormons were stuck in this difficult position of believing that Native Americans had a lot going for them, but also wanting to distance themselves from Native Americans at the same time. It's complicated and messy, um, for sure. And so, um, you know, really what I what I argue in the book uh, is that any time that there is a Mormon expulsion that takes place or, um, you know, an increase of tension between Mormons and outside society, one accusation that is there every time is that Mormons are conspiring with Indians. Uh, it takes place in, in Jackson County. It takes place uh, in Clay County. It takes place in the expulsion from Missouri altogether. It takes place in the, the Mormon exodus from Illinois. It takes place in the Utah War. Anytime that there's this broader fear, one accusation is that Mormons are conspiring with Indians or more savage than the savages. Um, it takes a variety of forms, but it's always there. Uh, and then you have Mormons on the inside who do have these theological beliefs that— um, Native Americans are the remnant of Jacob, and that the Book of Mormon uh, holds out significant promises for them, that they have a role to play in the winding up scene, that uh, in some situations Mormons argue they will become the battle axe of the Lord. Um, what that actually means, you know, um, in in uh, the minds of the Mormons who said it versus the minds of outsiders who also are sort of aware of some of these statements because the Mormons are apparently making them. Uh, and you have letters from Mormon leaders saying to Mormons on the ground, hey, um, yeah, that might be true, but let's kind of back away from making those claims because yeah. it's not winning us friends yeah. and it's not influencing people the way that we want it to. So, um, you know, it, it, it becomes really complicated with the Native Americans and their identity sort of um, – uh, you know, caught in the crosshairs uh, for, for, from both sides. So, you know, Brigham Young, I think, um, has this great statement uh, in a speech that he gives in Utah Territory, but he's remembering back and he's complaining, saying, well, look, you know, in in Missouri, we were sort of booted out because the charge was we were conspiring with the Indians. In Illinois, um, we were booted out because we were deemed uh, not good enough to associate with white people, and we had to go live with the savages. So sort of caught um, in this catch-22, he sort of points to. And I think it really is an interesting irony um, of how the Mormons actually felt, um, sort of the sense that um, they needed to stay away from Indians because they were conspiring with them against true white Americans. But they needed to go live with them because um, they weren't white enough. There was also, I, I also got the sense that there was occasionally Mormons could cash in on the idea that they might be collaborating with the Indians because they were still a minority group. They'd faced severe persecutions. They'd been driven from homes, and now in the Utah Valley, a, the president sent an army out. So, was there ever times when they might um, appreciate? The, the idea that that might make people think twice about messing with the Mormons? Did they ever cash in on that? 
Yeah, that's right. So during the Utah War, um, that's certainly one thrust of Brigham Young's overall idea in terms of um, trying to combat a potential war with the federal government. So in in attempting to kind of maybe line up um, uh, allies, he turns to the Native Americans and attempts to attract them to the Mormon side in a potential war against the federal government. Um, and certainly outsiders, um, you know, that's an accusation that's been there all along. The interesting thing that I point out in the book is that no one really considers Native American agency in any of these accusations. Uh, so no one considers that Native Americans have their own policies, their own ideas, their own reasons, their own negotiating power. In the accusations from the outside, they only come across as dupes of Mormon control. That they are simply um, waiting at the behest of Mormons to uh, do whatever the Mormon leaders tell them. And so it denigrates both Mormons and Native Americans uh, and, and racializes both groups in the process as not white. But for the Native Americans, just the suggestion that you know they're incapable of their own uh, policies and procedures um, really is a suggestion that you know they're unthinking and somehow they're in the control of the Mormon priesthood. And it's simply not true. I mean, um, that's the other thing that I point out is, is obviously that more than conspiracy and control, Mormons are fighting with Native Americans, right? So we have the Waka War, we have the Black Hawk War, we have uh, the Shoshone and Bannock who attack Fort Limhi and kills Mormons and it closes the mission down. Um, and all of those things, sort of the facts on the ground are ignored by outsiders and all they see is conspiracy and control. That's what's interesting about your history compared to some of the other histories that are out there is I feel like you spend a lot more time giving Native Americans their own historical agency. And it's funny because in the past, some treatments have kind of used Native Americans as a, as a, as a point of leverage in polemical battles because in some depictions of Mormon history, the idea is to make it faith-promoting. So you focus only on positive statements about helping Native Americans, it's cheaper to feed them than to fight them. And you don't talk about the fact that Mormons would shoot, some Mormons would shoot an Indian for stealing a horse or, or that those wars happened. On the other side, you have treatments of Mormonism being corrupt and cynically manipulating Indians, and the Indians are these stooges who get enlisted into things, and you show the stories a lot more complex. And the Mountain Meadows Massacre treatment is an example of this, where you talk about the accusation that Mormons have been dressing up as Indians. Yeah, so, um, you know, I was familiar with that uh, idea that Mormons dressed as Indians and killed white Americans, um, mostly in association with the Mountain Meadows Massacre, and realized that it, it was a factor in the historiography, and um, was curious uh, about that and I was really kind of stunned when I started doing research for this book when I came across an 1855 dime novel that included um, a illustration that I, I have in the book uh, uh, that simply labeled Mormons as Indian spies. And in this illustration, the Mormons are in the foreground and they look like what everyone would expect a Native American to look like. And then you have the poor unsuspecting traveler um, starting to wander through the picture. And, and um, the obvious notion, um, as articulated in the text of the book, is that the Mormon Indians are going to take out this uh, traveler. And that's published in 1855. That's two years before the Mountain Meadows Massacre takes place. And the more that I dug into it, I realized that this was sort of a standard discourse that predated the massacre by at least seven years. So the earliest account that I found was actually one articulated by William Smith, uh, Joseph Smith's younger brother, um, a former apostle that breaks with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and uh, flirts with a variety of schismatic groups, eventually will become affiliated with the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But in any case, in 1850, he publishes the accusation that Mormons are dressing as Indians and killing uh, travelers on the Overland Trail. And that's picked up by newspapers and repeated. And uh, he resurrects that charge uh, in 1857 as the Utah War is sort of playing out and is also reprinted just a few months before the massacre takes place. And so then the post-massacre charges of Mormons dressing as Indians almost don't miss a beat. It's sort of like the, the charge just 
uh, is is pretty consistent before the massacre and picks up right after the massacre. Now, it's, I think, pretty difficult to ferret out uh, Mormons dressed as Indians at the massacre. But I'm just simply uh, highlighting the notion that, you know, we need to or historians need to take into account the fact that this is something that predates the massacre and is a part of outside understanding of who Mormons are. That's Paul Reeve. He's an associate professor of history at the University of Utah. His new book, Religion of a Different Color, was just released from Oxford University Press. So we've talked about Native Americans. I want to talk about the Oriental chapter briefly because it gets less coverage in the book. And I just kind of wanted to focus on Reverend Thomas DeWitt Talmadge. This is a Presbyterian minister in 1880. And he gave two sermons, two weeks in a row, one on the Chinese question and the next week on the Mormon question. And the idea was that a lot of Chinese people had immigrated, especially to California, and there was worry that they were somehow uh, some sort of cancer within the American body. And then the other West Coast problem was the Mormons. And so the first week, speaking of Chinese, he's quite positive, almost defensive, apologetic. And then the second week, he's calling for the extermination of Mormons. So talk about how Mormons came to be linked with uh, Oriental people. Yeah, so I was really quite stunned by um, Reverend Talmadge's two speeches, and uh, when you juxtapose them against each other, it's really quite remarkable, uh, and you know, um, sort of stands out because a variety of people I found conflated Mormons with people of Asian descent in the 19th century. Talmadge is basically making this case that the Chinese should stay as. Uh, you know, the national kind of political scene is ratcheting up the pressure to produce the Chinese Exclusion Act, which does pass Congress in 1882. Uh, he's making the case that, in fact, they should stay and, and that, um, you know, God has brought them here. Uh, and a part of the reason he brought them here was so that they can convert to Christianity. And then the following week, he really just lambasts the Mormons. And in fact, they should go um, and uh, uses all kinds of uh, really violent rhetoric in suggesting that Mormons, if, if they don't um, <clears throat> listen to sort of um, nice appeals, then guns and bombs and everything else should be what uh, we expel them with. Uh, other people uh, conflated Mormons with, with uh, people of Asian descent, and, and in fact, um, this becomes one of the arguments that um, the Supreme Court uses in the 1879 Reynolds decision, is that, um, you know, it goes back to sort of whiteness equals uh, the government of, of a white race, whiteness equals democracy, uh, and the notion is, well, we can look around the globe, and there are no um, other societies that are practicing democracy other than white people. And therefore, the illogical argument was um, people who are not white are incapable of democracy. And so um, the same association is made with, with, with Mormons. Um, monogamy is um, the preserve of the white race. Polygamy is either Asiatic or African, and the Supreme Court buys this argument in the Reynolds decision and actually makes that case. And so the other thing that I sort of um, highlight is that the same Congress that passes the Chinese Exclusion Act passes the Edmonds Act in 1882 within a couple of months of each other, and this is not lost on the national press. And so the national press um, conflates Mormons and uh, Chinese in a variety of ways. Some of the headlines are the Mormons and the Chinese, two problems that must go, so they want both of them expelled. Um, others will variously favor um, keeping the Chinese but expelling the Mormons, and some will favor uh, the Mormons over the Chinese. But in any case, they're pretty uh, consistently conflated in the, the national mind as two Oriental problems on American soil. And that orientalness of Mormonism was mostly related to government, the way that Mormons were perceived to structure their government and the fact that they practiced polygamy? Correct. Yeah. So um, uh, adherence to theocratic rule and polygamy, uh, again, a deterioration from what um, any Anglo-Saxon freedom-loving person would, would um, participate in. So we're going to move on to blacks next. But before we do, I also wanted to point out that there weren't really any stories of individual Mormons who were of Asian descent um, in the book. And I just wanted to ask about that, if there just weren't any Asian Mormons or what the circumstances were. Yeah, you know, um, 
there were Asian Mormons, and, and you know, records do indicate that um, you know the first conversions of Chinese took place in in Hawaii, um, and there were efforts at converting. Uh, Chinese immigrants in California, and some Mormons were very enthusiastic about this. Um, you also have editorials published in the Deseret News um, arguing against Chinese exclusion. In fact, the Mormons are arguing that the, you know Chinese should be allowed to remain, and they send missionaries to China itself, but the success is just really minimal. And so really wasn't able to kind of latch on to any of these stories to highlight it, but there were efforts, in other words, and there is evidence that some Chinese immigrants in Hawaii did convert, but the numbers were never large. And, um, you know, by the time that you have Chinese living in Utah, uh, Mormons really aren't making a concerted missionary effort uh, amongst them. It's actually the Protestant churches in Utah who do more outreach than than the Mormons do. Mm-hmm. I think by that point, you know, the conflation has really been kind of labeled onto the Mormons or or projected onto the Mormons. And um, one way in which you claim whiteness for yourself is by distancing yourself from other marginal groups, Um, never to the degree that they do against, you know, blacks. But in any case, um, they weren't, you know, sort of a generally missionary minded church who earlier had sent missionaries to China itself um, really didn't do a lot to try to missionize amongst Chinese immigrants once they arrive in Utah. Perhaps one of the most difficult parts of the book for contemporary Mormons who pick it up and read it will probably be the chapters on Mormonism and black people. So let's begin by talking about one of the biggest ironies you note. You say, the very universalism of the opening decades of Mormonism laid the groundwork for later racial constriction. So you're arguing that in, in the earliest years of Mormonism, there was a, a more expansive vision of universalism of the human family, which ironically laid the groundwork for later, more restrictive views. Yeah, um, and, you know, I hope that um, readers will actually, you know, welcome this notion of, of the initial decades of Mormonism being very universally minded and expansive in terms of the vision of who is included in this gospel outreach. Uh, you know, and I, and I quote a variety of early Mormon leaders in, in their expansive vision. Um, and uh, their notion for who's going to worship in the Nauvoo Temple is very expansive. And it explicitly says that people of all colors and all nations we invite to worship in the sanctuary with us. And, um, you know, uh, Parley Pratt is talking about spreading the gospel to Africa and um, the entire globe. And William W. Phelps talks about um, his expansive notion that the gospel message and, and redemption in Christ Jesus is for Shem, Ham, and Japheth, which is sort of the, um, especially for religious people, the way that they understood uh, racial distinction. Um, How did that break down? Well, it, it it goes back to sort of the, um, you know, religious notions of repopulating the world after the Great Flood. Um, so these are obviously uh, Noah's children, and the understanding was that the three races, the three major races, yellow, white, and black, come from those children, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Mormonisms were using that to paint a picture of a universalism rather than an exclusivism? That's exactly right. So people like Phelps and, and other Mormon leaders are saying, you know, this is um, a gospel message for all, for Shem, Ham, and Japheth. In other words, very expansive kind of notion of who uh, they envision as a part of the Mormon fold. And the other thing that substantiates this notion is then the accusations from the outside. So you have internal messages from Mormons saying we have this open um, and universal gospel message. And then outsiders, the accusations in the early decades of Mormonism is that, in fact, they are too inclusive. They are establishing a society of rogues and vagabonds and freed blacks. They are welcoming people of all colors. These are the charges. These are not uh, charges that um, you know are positive in the 19th century. In a society that favors segregation of undesirable peoples, they're charging Mormons with being too inclusive. 
that's really an important notion for the readers to sort of get in their minds is that Mormons are being accused of being too inclusive and accepting all people in all colors, including some people will say Africans and Indians. Okay? So they will even specify they are accepting black people and they're accepting Native Americans. The first black person to join the church is 1830 in Kirtland, Black Pete. And within a few months, you have news accounts published in Philadelphia and New York. Mormons have a black person worshiping with them. This is not a compliment about yeah. Mormon uh, diversity. Okay, um, These are accusations leveled against the Mormons, and it's only just um, gained steam in, in Missouri when Phelps publishes an article about free people of color. And he's saying to black Mormons, if you're coming to Missouri— this is great. This is Zion. This is where we need to gather. But beware. Missouri has racial codes in place that you have to have papers that specify your status as a freed black. Otherwise, you're subject to whipping. And he actually quotes the Missouri state code. You're subject to whipping and expulsion from the state. So Mormonism has no special rule, he says, in terms of people of color. But just be warned, if you're a black Mormon coming to Missouri to gather with the saints, that there are laws in place that govern your ability to freely move about in Missouri. And that sets off all kinds of consternation amongst outsiders in Missouri. Mormons are inviting blacks to start a slave revolution, they say. And they're trying to steal our white wives and daughters, they say. And it's fear of race mixing and, um, you know, a potential slave rebellion that um, causes a significant factor in the expulsion from Jackson County, in fact. So then you have the reaction to that. So this openness of early Mormonism later, you say it laid the groundwork for later discrimination. Um, yeah, that's right. So um, I, I think, you know, especially if you place it within this bigger um, religious context, you have other churches going through very difficult times vis-a-vis -vis, um, blackness and slavery in the 19th century. And so uh, the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians all either split altogether or have schisms as a result of these questions that are percolating in American society. And you have southern branches of those churches to this day as a result of this context that we're talking about. Mormonism actually avoids any sort of split or schism over those racial issues because it has this expansive universal vision. They are baptizing freed blacks as well as black slaves. But because of this highly charged racial context, there are some stipulations. Joseph Smith will say, if you're going to preach to a black slave, make sure you have the permission of their masters or convert their masters first. Okay, we don't want uh, accusations of inciting slave rebellions leveled against us. And they would publicly say that too, right? Like after the Phelps article, Mormons publicly tried to say, whoa, hold on, because they knew that it was like a tinderbox. And so in a way, they kind of sold their black brothers and sisters out a little bit by saying, okay, we're going to walk this back a little bit. And let's be very clear, we're not trying to incite slave rebellions. We also have policies about preaching to blacks and that sort of thing. Absolutely right. Yes. Uh, so Joseph Smith and, and other Mormon leaders actually published this, and they really try to calm the, 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 the racial storm. And they try to also do so out of concern for Mormon missionaries preaching in the South, a violence that might be leveled against them. And so, yeah, they are sort of entering into a very charged national debate. Uh, and other uh, religious groups at the same time are also issuing statements against immediate abolitionism. This is seen as a very fearful kind of brand of anti-slavery. Uh, those who want to immediately free the slaves, it's a twofold problem, right? Race uh, and slavery is a twofold a problem. Um, you have a group of people who are not free, which violates American standards of, of um, independence and freedom established in, in you know, the Revolutionary War and the Declaration of Independence. But the other problem is a racial problem. What do you do with blacks once they're freed? And the vast majority of Americans, this is really an, a, crucial, a crucial point to understand, the vast majority of Americans don't want black people living amongst them. The vast majority are the more conservative uh, colonizationist stripe, right? We don't like slavery, but we don't want black people living amongst us either. So the other part of the problem is you get rid of slavery, but what do you do with the blacks once they're free? And the vast majority are colonizationists who say we should send them to Africa. 
Uh, and so Mormonism sort of uh, is immersed in that context and is of the more conservative uh, stripe, colonizationist stripe, uh, despite the charges that they are trying to uh, foment you know, ra- uh, racial rebellion and that they're trying to produce, um, you know, a mixture of the races. Uh, so Joseph Smith and other Mormon leaders do respond out of that same kind of context, trying to protect white missionaries as well as establish some policies saying, hey, if you're going to preach to slaves, get permission from their masters. If you're going to baptize them, make sure you um, convert the masters first to defend themselves against charges of inciting slave rebellion. Okay, so Mormons are dealing with sort of political issues in those instances, talking about blacks coming into Missouri and what they need to be aware of, and then kind of walking back and making, assuring people that they're not encouraging slaves to come and that sort of thing. Now, that's more political with the church itself on issues of priesthood. Mm -hmm. How did the ban come about? Let's talk about the priesthood restriction against blacks. Black men could not hold the priesthood and, and could not attend the temple, and so likewise, black Mormon women would then be excluded from the temple as well. So Joseph Smith, what was his part in that? Paul Reeve will address that question in the next episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges, and thanks for listening.